First of all, let me say that I've had the advantage of listening to the ladies who and gentlemen who have spoken before me. And I want to preface my very brief intervention by reading an excerpt of a book which I commend to all of you. The book is written by a friend of mine who is from Ghana. He is a former lecturer at the University of Cape Coast in Ghana and a traditional ruler. And the title of the book is African Culture in Governance and Development, the Ghana Paradigm. But what I want to preface my intervention with is this quotation, which is found on page 36 of the book, and it reads, permit me to read it. When we look at this African independence explosion, we must take into consideration that not one African nation came to power using a conventional African structure of government. Every one of them used an imitation parliamentary procedure taken from Europe. Africa will never succeed using European parliamentary techniques. And I dare add that after they imitated Europe, they then tried to imitate the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And I think that statement is very important to the approach that I'm going to take about philanthropy. And I dare say that today, in Africa, we may talk of something called the philanthropy industry. And I dare say at the very beginning that despite the best intention of the best Western philanthropy organizations, they have largely contributed into disempowering Africans and they have contributed into making Africans go into slumber, and they have succeeded in creating what I call a cargo cult mentality amongst Africans, particularly the elite. You will see, for example, that many of these organizations recruit some of our best men and women. And very quickly, they reduce them into proposal writing. And very quickly, they reduce them into report making. And very quickly, they reduce them into attending workshops, seminars, or similar gatherings. And I want to suggest that that is as humiliating as it is disempowering. Many will say that African communities have benefited immensely because of these interventions, but I think not, and I'll demonstrate why. If you look at many African countries, and I travel across Africa to speak with some measure of authority, and I travel in African communities where particularly Western philanthropy organizations and American philanthropy organizations have intervened, either to provide water through borehole or to provide health services, or to engage in agriculture, to empower people in agriculture. And there is no shortage of rosy material that they have then disseminated to the world to suggest that but for their intervention, the communities in which they were would be long dead. But my submission is that their interventions have contributed in disempowering those communities. 
Many of you will remember towards the end of the last century, there was something called the Millennium Villages. And not very far from my rural home, in a place called Bar Sauri, there was a Millennium Village. It existed and appeared to thrive as long as the donors were there. It was touted as one of the most successful interventions. The name that then came, I think, was a gentleman called Geoffrey Sachs. They talked about how the health sector had improved, how the people had portable water, how women had been empowered, how women had been liberated from using charcoal. Today, that Bar Sauri is as dead as Dodo. It doesn't exist. Because the philosophy that informed that intervention was arrogant. It was based on the assumption that the people did not know what they wanted and that it is the donors or the funders who knew what was good for them. And indeed, no sooner had they left than their project followed them. And I'm suggesting, as I said at the very outset, I'm now convinced beyond paradventure that the intervention that we see from Western donor organizations will never, ever help Africa. They may appear to do so, but they are purely anodyne. They make you not feel the pain, but ultimately they will ensure that you are incapable of doing the simple things that you can do. I remember a few years ago, I was in an organization which was granted 1 million Kenya shillings by a Swiss organization. When some of the individuals in the organization then gave reports to their Swiss funders, first of all, they proceeded on the assumption that the people who had been given the money were thieves. The questions that they were asked and the manner in which the reporting system was framed was the assumption, these are thieves and therefore you must keep them on a short leash. And I found that very insulting. And many of you who are in organizations, whether they are NGOs or CBOs, will find that many times donors talk down to you. And even if they don't, the politeness that appears to be the modus operandi of engagement is a mere veneer, which is meant to humanize the relationship, but in their inner hearts, they don't think that you are worthy much. I speak these painful truths because I've seen enough African villages being dehumanized. If you go to the informal sectors, whether they are in Nairobi, Kenya, and Kibera, and you counted the number of interventions that have taken place over the years, or you go to Makoko in Nigeria, in Lagos, or you go to the slums of Luanda in Angola, or you go to the slums in South Africa, there are no shortage of Western funding organizations which have been dealing with the provision of water even for 10 years within a radius of no more than two kilometers, but the problem is never solved. Several years ago, I had the fortune of serving in an organization that made me travel to different parts of Kenya. And I remember in Wajia, an old man came and told us in Kiswahili, you have also come. And we asked, why do you ask that question? He said, many have come. We have seen organizations from America, from Europe and from different parts of the world. They have come here to sink boreholes. You also have come, but we know that you can never solve our problems. It is only us who must solve our problems. 
And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, with all the courage that I can master this evening, that I'm now convinced that until the day the Africans are capable of finding their basic things, you will always be at the beck and call of Ford Foundation, and I hope they are here and they are one of the better organizations. You'll always be at the beck and call of Oxfam. You'll always be at the beck and call of USID. You'll always be at the beck and call of all these organizations that you know them from Sweden, from Denmark, from Germany, from the United States of America, from the United Kingdom. You know them and you operate with them on a daily basis. Let me tell you, Africa is not going to be changed by them. Our societies are not going to be changed by them. We have to remember that they too have their own agenda, declared or undeclared. I've never understood, for example, when an American organization or a British organization gives a Kenyan organization money, and then they say that your accounts must be audited by a tier one accounting firm. Who creates this tier one accounting firms? Who determines that a firm is tier one? Who determines that a firm is international? It is the same organizations. So that in order to qualify for their funding, you must be audited by Ernest and Young. You must be audited by Deloitte and Tush. You must be audited by Price Waterhouse, not Kamau and Gidongo, not Onyango and, and Makoha. No, those are not tier one and they can never be tier one, notwithstanding that they also studied accounts and they are capable of auditing these, auditing these books. If that is not disempowering, tell me, ladies and gentlemen, what is disempowering? If therefore that is what we call philanthropy, then in my view, that philanthropy is an industry which benefits not us, but them. And I'm suggesting to you that until the day we decolonize the way we do things, I will give a personal example. You may ask, but he's ranting eloquent and pontificating. Has he done anything? Yes. I run a foundation which is present in 39 African countries. I've never asked for a single cent from any donor organization, not one, and I will never. How do I fund my activities? From my own resources, I contribute a little and my friends contribute a little. And I reject funding, whether it is from Ford Foundation or USID, or any other organization because immediately I accept that funding, I lose my independence and they begin to control how I run my accounts. They begin to control how I write my reports. They begin to behave like major domos in their relationship to me. It can be done. And we are cutting our court according to our sizes. Only yesterday, we spent, we sent no, not much money just $500 to help cultivate an acre of land in Monrovia in Liberia, and is beginning to work. And I believe that Africa must begin to think like that. $500, $1,000, not $80 million, which is disempowering. So in a nutshell, as I conclude, I am of the considered opinion that we live in a, in a global world, as we are told. But for how long will Africa believe that her very basic problems of water, of food, of sanitation, of education, of health will be solved by other civilizations? For how long? Right now, as I speak to you in a matter that is not related, the IMF and the World Bank have come into Kenya and they are now telling Kenya, you must close some of your universities. You must restructure your university. 
It's like somebody going into your house and telling you, you must now do as I say, not as you will. And this is what many of these organizations do. They may deny it, but despite their best intentions, because these organizations also receive monies, and these monies are from taxpayers. The Ford Foundation will receive money from institutions in the United States of America. USID will receive money from the taxpayers of the United States of America, Oxfam, and all these other organizations, Hendrich Ball, Conrad Adenauer, CEDA, and all these. And those organizations have their own rules. And when they come to Africa, they want to de-Africanize your process and to make them to conform to their own processes. I'm suggesting, as I read at the very outset, the time has come that African institutions must find ways and means of doing their own things. If you are an NGO that has been receiving money from Ford Foundation, you must now begin to think, when will Ford Foundation leave? When will USID leave? When will Enrich Ball leave? When will Conrad Adenauer leave? And the sooner they stop funding you, the freer you become. And even if you used to do a million things because of their funding, you'll be much safer if you did only one thing with your funding. That to me is what will make Africa begin to realize our potential. Because ladies and gentlemen, for how long will this happen? For how long? Will Ford Foundation be present in Africa? For how long? For how long will all these organizations be in Africa doing water, doing HIV, coming to your villages and helping widows, coming to your villages under the one acre farm and teaching you how to till land? For how long? And it starts with the mind. And I dare say, at the risk of annoying my colleagues who are here, it is we who have had the advantage of formal, fundamentally Western education who are our own enemies. Our kith and kin in rural Kenya and in formal settlements can't write a proposal. It is we who have become masters at writing proposals. We must learn something else. It is we who have become masters at writing reports whose templates are made in Stockholm or in Copenhagen or in Washington or in London or in some other place. We must unlearn those things. And there is now no shortage of Africans who are capable of engaging in, in philanthropy. I'm doing a list of Africans who I believe are millionaires in their own rights. I used to belong to an organization which was African, East African Grant Makers Association. And the whole idea of the East African Grant Makers Association was to have a directory of African grant makers. It was organized under the aegis of Ufadili. And when we did a directory of Africans in East Africa who had the capacity to make grants, you would be amazed. There are very many of them. But most of them are also caught up in these Western models. So it is not true to say that Africans do not have models of, of philanthropy. We do. If you go to the gentleman whose book I've read, Nana Kobina Nketia in Ghana, under the systems that you find in Ghana, there are grants that the Oman Hen, who is the chief, gives to his community and people bring money to him and he shares with the community. The Oni of Ife in Nigeria or the Alafin of of, of Oyo in Nigeria, who are the traditional chieftains, have programs which they run, which are informed by the tradition. If you go to the Kabaka Foundation in Uganda, there is no shortage. The only thing is that they are not as well publicized. And today I can tell you there are over 100, over 1,000 African millionaires in dollar terms 
who are capable of supporting African initiatives. In order for us to liberate ourselves from this Western, that is not to say that we don't borrow from them. We borrow creatively. Just don't need to borrow from the West only. We must we can borrow from other initiatives. What we can then do is to come up with models, which models are going to be useful and sensitive to the reality. And, I'm, and, and I'm, I've given you a personal example. My for the Pierre Lumumba Foundation has never received a cent from any of these donor organizations. And I'm present in 39 African countries, 39. And people are doing what they can. They are in agriculture. They are in cyber cafes and, and, and they generate funds. One of the things that we tell them, don't ever ask for money from Ford Foundation, from Henrich Paul, from Conrad Adena, don't. We'll get you money from Africans. It's been working since 1990. We are not as well publicized, but we have a model which has borrowed from others and a model which therefore can be improved. And in that way, I enjoy the freedom. I can say what I'm saying because even if I annoyed somebody from Ford Foundation, I'm not going to ask for money from Ford Foundation so I can speak freely. But those who are going to ask for money from Ford Foundation or Conrad at NR Foundation had better measure their words because they'll need them and they'll remember how boldly you spoke. The last thing that I'm saying is this. I'm not convinced for one moment that if we disengage, we find ourselves in a situation where there are people who want to help. If somebody wants to help you, it must be time bound. Help must be time bound. Have you ever had a conversation with any of these donor organizations and asked them, you've been in Kenya for 20 years. When are you leaving Kenya? When are you leaving Africa? When will you consider your work to have been done and finished? Do they have a program of exiting the scene? No, they intend to exist in perpetuity. They intend to be helping people in Kibera in perpetuity because philanthropy is an industry and poverty has also become an industry. But if we were to engage with them, Ford Foundation will say, we helped you for 10 years, we are now going back to the United States and we'll continue our activities in different areas. And I'm saying that we in the African continent are being helped in very basic areas. I don't want somebody to be giving me water, surely. I don't some, want somebody from Europe to be giving me antiretrovirus, surely. I don't want somebody under the guise of one acre to be giving me seed from to, to plant in my rural home in Kenya. I don't want that, I can do that. But we have now been made to believe that unless they give us that, unless they give us three siblings, we cannot do it. We are waiting. We have created an army of people across Africa who has, and a Nigerian author once said, they are simply waiting for Godot to bring the things that they long wanted. And until Godot comes, they are not going to do something for themselves. And I'm suggesting, Al, that you who and you who are in that space and the others in that space, the conversation must now begin with this organization. You are here, you've been good to us, but there is a time that you must leave. And I conclude my answer with this particular statement, which I want you to uh, see if you, those of you who have watched the film Gandhi by Sir Richard Attenborough, Give me just one latitude that I may make this statement, it will make the point. Mahatma Gandhi is fighting for the independence of India. One of his greatest confidence is a clergyman called Charlie Andrews. In 1947-46, Charlie Andrews receives an invitation to leave India to go for Fiji, but he does not want to go. This is what Mahatma Gandhi tells him, Charlie, we have been good friends. Between me and you, there will be no goodbyes. But I want you to accept the assignment in Fiji because their time has come when Indians must now believe 
that they can do it themselves. When they know that they can do it themselves, it will be dignified for them. They'll make to make they'll begin to appreciate that labor is dignified. They'll begin to know that they can do it themselves. That is not to say that we do not need help. We may need it, but allow us to ask for it when we have tried and we are stuck. That is my message. In concluding, I'm saying, I think number one, that philanthropy has become an industry. Number two, that philanthropy has created a situation where Africans now suffer from the cargo cult mentality. Number three, I think that philanthropy has disempowered Africa. Number four, I think that the hegemonic nature of Western philanthropy organizations has undermined our capacities. And number five, I think that it has, in a very subtle way, served to enslave us in a manner that we cannot think for ourselves, even in areas that are of a very mundane nature.